Kansas, gateway to Oz. Under the rainbow, this is where it was. Hollyhocks and red ripe tomatoes, and churned homemade ice cream. Let me tell you, Kansas is more than tornadoes. It's the best part of Dorothy's dream. Today on Around Kansas, we first look at one of the top three pivotal dates in Kansas history, 1867. Next, meet Steve Brody, a hard-living, hard-drinking actor from Kansas who appeared in many westerns and action films in the 50s and 60s. Then enjoy a poem from Ron Wilson, and we'll end with a look at the bald eagle Find them in Kansas near lakes, rivers, and marshes. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego, just a short drive down the Yellow Brick Road. It's an early January morning, but we're going to brighten up your day. I'm Frank. I'm Deb. And this is Around Kansas. Yes, we're going to brighten your day, and we got some, th you know, middle of the winter, that doesn't stop us from having fun. Yeah. We got some big events coming up, and I want to let you in. You know, we shared um, the clip from the Home on the Range documentary. Um, I can't tell you how great this documentary is going to be. We gave you just a little sample of the couple of interviews that I did with Michael Martin Murphy and Ken Spurgeon, the filmmaker. But if you want to see the whole thing, Friday night is the world premiere at the Wichita Orpheum Theater, 7 o'clock. Um, Saturday, the Center Theater in Smith Center, Kansas, so the hometown of the Home on the Range song. And then on Sunday, oh, wait a minute, For, um, Saturday will be a matinee, and then Sunday will be a matinee. Then on January 29th, we'll have the Home on the Range, that's Kansas Day, of course, We'll show the Home on the Range documentary at the Fort Wallace Museum in Wallace, Kansas. February 19th at the Brown, Brown Grand Theater in Concordia. And February 24th at the Murdoch Theater in Wichita to benefit the Northfield High School. And there are some other um, screenings that are being scheduled. If you want to schedule a screening, you can just send me an email and um, I can hook you up. Um, it's, it's going to be phenomenal. Uh, this will, um, this is going to spread far and wide beyond Kansas, and I think it's going to make all Kansans proud when they see it. So we need a screening here in Topeka. Mm -hmm. So who wants to do a screening here in Topeka? Your living room, Frank, would be perfect for a screening of the family. <laughs> we could do it here in the Dillon House. We could do it here in the Dillon House. What a great place. Yes, we could have hors d'oeuvres and a nice time, champagne. That would be good idea, Frank. Hey, we good have job. a party. <laughs> good job. Good job. But really, if you've got a beautiful theater, the Grand, um, the Brown Theater in Concordia. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that one, Frank? Mm. You did a story on some of the... Some of the restored theaters, yeah. And there's a lot of them around the state that would be perfect to show this film. That's one I didn't do, though. <laughs> It is stunning. It is stunning. We had um, um, one of the screenings for... I think it was Bloody Dawn, one of the Lone Chimney films, at the Brown Theater, and it's spectacular. It's just, you know, of course, uh, Concordia is the most beautiful town. They've got the most wonderful museums and the sweetest people, the nicest museums, and really love their history and do such a beautiful job with it. And the Brown Theater is just kind of the... the um, decoration on the cake of this beautiful town in Cloud County. It's so pretty. Cloud County is famous for something other than Boston Corbett, you know. <laughs> okay. All right, we won't go there. we got a great show for you. Stay with us. Buffalo Bill Cody earned his legendary title in Oakley. Bring the family and come celebrate Oakley's pioneering history and unique geography at two sites, the Buffalo Bill Cultural Center and the Fick Fossil Museum. Cody's statue marks his achievements and welcomes visitors to the Cultural Center. The Fick Fossil Museum houses world-class fossils and artifacts. You'll find Oakley at the hub of U.S. Highways 83 and 40 and I-70. Stop for the legend. Stay for the day. Discover Oakley. 
Lecompton, the name was splashed across newspapers throughout America and Europe. It was debated in the halls of Congress. Lecompton interprets its unique territorial history with two museums and other sites. Events throughout the year celebrate history and community. Visit the Territorial Capital Museum where more than 70 trees are displayed with thousands of antique and vintage ornaments. And be sure to stop in the gift shops in both Lecompton museums. Spend the day in historic Lecompton, shopping, eating, savoring the rich history. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Supply. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center. Your stem cells, your health, your life. And we're back again. So, 2017, well underway around Kansas, of course. Gosh, we've been on the air now for what? Four years? Five that years? Right. Gosh, isn't that something? Uh, a lot of events and celebrations and all of that. In fact, you have one you'd like to talk about. Uh, of course I do. Um, Fort Wallace, um, the Memorial Association at Fort Wallace, will be hosting the Great Fort Wallace and Western Kansas 1867 Exposition July 6th through the 9th. Huh. So we'll have bus tours of the scenic byways. We will have a symposium for the nerd faction out there, you know, the scholarly folks. Then we'll have an encampment, which will reflect the uh, 1867 and before. So the um, Cheyenne, the other tribes that would have been in the area on through the pioneers and the railroad and just so many cool things. And then on Sunday, we will have a um, ceremony at the cemetery, the Fort Wallace Cemetery, where a 7th Cavalry marker is uh, kind of the center of that cemetery, and it's one that the 7th Cavalry erected for its comrades, so it's a really beautiful marker. Highlight will be a concert by Michael Martin Murphy. He is coming to Wallace, Kansas. Huh. Is that not cool? That's cool. Fort Hayes will be having its 150th anniversary. Um, there's so many events, so if we don't mention yours, this is a good time, you know, let me know about it so that we can get that on the air. Be, uh, Great to advertise with us, you know, advertise your event with us, and uh, we will be happy to share it. And, you know, 1857 is when the Hayes House in, over in, in Council, Council Grove, Grove was founded. Yeah. I'm going to be speaking in Council Grove in uh, June. Huh. June. Um, the Kaw Indian Mission, our good friend Mark Brooks down there, um, asked me if I would be one of their regular speakers. So they have looked them up on online. The speakers series um, this year, the theme is the Santa Fe Trail. So I'm going to be talking about the Sumner Expedition on the Santa Fe Trail in uh, 1857. Good job, Frank. Yeah. Man, it's you're... amazing I remembered that. You it's are. just that, and that this isn't to get a free lunch, but I love I, the Hayes yeah. House. If you've never been there, you <laughs> it's gotta... awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. I mean, they after what? <laughs> 1857, by now, they really have they the recipes really down. got it right. Well, let's take a look at 1867 in Kansas. There are three pivotal dates in Kansas history. 1854, when the Kansas-Nebraska Act was signed and the territory was opened for settlement. 1861, when Kansas was admitted to the Union as a free state. And 1867, when a third of the counties were established and the Plains Indian Wars escalated in the West. In 2017, we will mark the 150th anniversary of so many places and events in Kansas that we should just begin the commemorations now and continue them throughout the year. The Medicine Lodge Peace Treaty, the Kidder Massacre, the founding of Fort Hayes, the Battle at Fort Wallace, and then this landmark event in government. In November of 1867, the state held a referendum on a proposed constitutional amendment to grant women the full right to vote, Women had limited voting rights already. It was the first ever referendum on women's suffrage in U.S. history and specifically sought to amend Section 1, Article 5 of the state constitution 
to eliminate the word male from the clause defining the qualifications of an elector. The amendment had been approved by the legislature, but had to be ratified by the all-white male electorate of the state. The proposed amendment shared the November ballot with a proposition to eliminate the word white from the clause, defining the qualifications of an elector and allow African-American males the right to vote. The results of the Kansas election saw both women's and black suffrage defeated, with black suffrage receiving 10,483 votes and women's receiving 9,070. With the defeat, equal rights activists were forced to realize that their campaign had failed. The failure of the campaign stemmed from the tensions within the Equal Rights Association. The major problem arose from the fact that many members were feminists and abolitionists torn between supporting suffrage or fighting for freed men and women at the same time. It would be decades before these issues passed. But in looking back at the events of 1867, the suffrage debate reflected the upheaval following the Civil War. The interesting times were not over and, in fact, were just beginning. I was in an accident where I fell off a roof. I don't know why I started to research stem cells, but I did. And I visited with the doctors. They were excellent. I had my neck done, my shoulders done, section of my back, my hips, my sacrum, my sciatica, and my tailbone. Now I am having better range of motion in my arms and my neck and my back. It was a long road to get there, but I'm so glad that I found them. This segment brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. Back again. So, this is around Kansas, by the way. In case you just tuned in, I'm Frank, she's Deb. And we're here every Wednesday morning this time. <laughs> so anyway, tune in. Hey, you know, we've talked about, uh, Kansas has a lot, a lot of famous people. A lot. And I don't know why people think, oh, I'm really surprised. But uh, there are a lot of talented people that have gone on to uh, Broadway, to movies, to television, and all of that. And I get to do a story about one of those coming up. And uh, when I first got on to the story, I thought, let's see. And then I remembered uh, what he looked like and, and some of the uh, uh, movies and TV shows that he was in. We're talking about uh, a man named Steve Brody. That's his uh, theatrical name. And you will recognize his face. Yeah, um, you will. That's, uh, and especially now, you know, people who are fans of classic TV shows and, and um, older classic movies, um, he was everywhere. <laughs> and I think part of the reason that people are surprised when we have so much talent is because our population is so small. <laughs> we have, um, basically, we're 1% of the U.S. population. So when you think that Kansas is 1% of the population and we have so much talent to export, that's pretty amazing, Frank. Yes, it is. It's it really is. cool. So anyway, let's take a look. Steve Brody. There are lots of fans of classic television westerns and films that will recognize the face of Steve Brody. He even had a recurring role in the TV show Wyatt Earp. But unlike Wyatt himself, Steve had an even stronger Kansas connection. He was born in Kansas. That invaluable encyclopedia of film, the International Movie Database, reports that Steve was born John Doherty Stevens on November 25, 1919, in El Dorado. Raised in Wichita, he dropped out of school and raced cars, boxed, and worked on oil rigs to get by. He initially entertained a criminal law career, but that interest quickly wore off. He had a passion for acting and found early work in summer stock, changing his stage name to Steve Brody. A move to New York did not pay off, but a subsequent move to Los Angeles did. He broke into films after being spotted by an MGM talent scout in a Hollywood theater production entitled Money Girls. Loaned out for his first uh, film, Universal's Ladies Courageous, Brody appeared in a few tough guy bit parts in such MGM films as 30 Seconds Over Tokyo and Anchors Away before he was dropped. It wasn't long before he was signed by RKO 
and it was with this studio that his reputation as a heavy in westerns grew with such roles as notorious outlaws Bob Dalton in Bad Man's Territory and Cole Younger in Return of the Bad Men. In between those two pictures were strong roles, uh, strong roles in film noir classics, including the leading role in Desperate. A hard-living, hard-drinking actor, Brody married actress Lois Andrews in 1946, but the couple divorced. He married Barbara Savitt, and the union produced son Kevin Brody two years later. Kevin later became a producer-director. Interest in Brody eventually waned at the studio, and his contract was not renewed. Freelancing elsewhere, he appeared as a lead in Rose of the Yukon and another classic film noir, Armored Car Robbery, and also earned good starts, uh, parts in Home of the Brave and Lady in the Iron Mask as the Musketeer Athos. A familiar presence on 1950s and 60s television, he worked on such crime series as Public Defender, Hawaiian Eye, Surfside Six, Perry Mason, and such Western series as The Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp, The Lone Ranger, Adventures of Wild Bill Hickok, Laramie, Sugarfoot, Maverick, Rawhide, Gunsmoke, and even Ozzie and Harriet and the Beverly Hillbillies. Brody's later years were marred by drinking arrests. In the 1970s, he made sporadic appearances, including a lead in the campy, low-budget horror film, The Giant Spider Invasion. He also provided voice work in commercials and showed up at nostalgia conventions. In 1973, Brody married a third time to Virginia Hefner, and they had a son, Sean. Suffering from esophageal cancer and heart problems, Brody died at age 72 on January 9, 1992, at a West Hills, California hospital. Fort Wallace stood on the frontier in the midst of the Plains Indians Wars on a major stage route and rail line. Beside the 1865 Stagecoach Station, a modern museum with thousands of artifacts tell that story, like the fossil of a 40-foot plesiosaur is suspended from the ceiling. Located on Highway 40, midway between Hayes and Colorado Springs, the Fort Wallace Museum is as welcome a site today as the fort itself in the 1860s. Discover the fightingest fort in the West. Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. This segment brought to you by Kansas Grain Sorghum, growers working together. Find out more at ksgrainsorghum.org. Another landmark of the Flint Hills are the deep ravines, the deep draws, and the stone, which might look simple to a bureaucrat sitting at a desk, but when it comes time to build fences, you need to call on somebody special. This poem is entitled, Uphill and Down a tribute to the fencing man. The government man sits at a desk and draws a simple line and says here where the property ends, a fence here would be fine. But what seems so simple in the government domain doesn't match the real world of the natural terrain. For when we need a fence built across this rugged land, we need a hard working expert. We need the fencing man. Yes, the fencing man is he who suffers the consequence when the Flint Hills are the place that's required to build a fence. By contrast, in the flatlands, building fence can be a breeze. But out here in the Flint Hills, we can't build a fence with ease. When that line cuts across the steepest of these hills, it creates a major challenge which the fencing man fulfills. It's one thing to build fence where the land is flat and level, but it's different on these hillsides with a 60 degree bevel. It's a place where a pickup truck or four-wheeler can't squeeze, so he drags a chainsaw out by hand to cut the brush and trees. Seems it's the most inaccessible place we need the fences most, so he's hiking up a side hill with a driver and T-posts. Then he's sliding down the draw where the sides are very steep and the ground is too darn rocky to drive the posts in very deep. 
So while the government man draws a line across the aerial maps, the fencing man is on the ground with barbed wire and water gaps. It looks easy sitting in a room drawing up a man-made plan, but it ain't easy in the Flint Hills, so we salute the fencing man. Happy trails. As fourth generation farmers themselves, Heinen Brothers Ag Service understands the risk and rewards of farming. So when it comes to quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia, call Heinen Brothers Ag today, 800-760-4964. Buying a car shouldn't be this hard. And at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego, it isn't. It's actually awesome. Whether you want a new or used car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. Even if you want to custom order a new car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. See Toby's team at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego. We're awesome. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Here we are again. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of chuckling a little bit because uh, we're going to have a story on bald eagles. And I don't know, I, I'm not trying to uh, be smarter than thou, but you know, when I was growing up, because uh, my name Chafin in England really meant a uh, little bald man down the road. And I thought... You're making this up. No, 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 I'm not. And I thought... Oh, gosh, so my ancestor was some little bald man down the road. And then I understood and found out later when my vocabulary grew that bald meant white-haired. Oh. So it was a little white-haired man down the road. Which is slightly better, I guess. With my ancestor in England. So anyway, and so when you're talking about something that's bald, like the bald eagle. Which is really not bald either. It's not bald, it's white. It's, it's got a white it's, head. It's got white hair or white feathers, as it be. There you go. You know, we've got uh, apparently an abundance of eagles in Kansas, and not only the bald eagle, but, of course, the golden eagle. We'll do a segment on them later. I was walking over on the Menninger campus one time, or not the Menninger campus, but the state hospital grounds. Mm -hmm. So it's not far. I was not an inpatient. Um, that was after that, <laughs> after they let me out. Um and this, I'd never seen this before, Frank. We don't have a lot of eagles where I grew up. And this golden eagle swooped down and caught a squirrel. Pretty amazing. There is a Facebook page dedicated to the sightings of bald eagles in Kansas. There are some beautiful photographs throughout the state of our national emblem, which apparently is flourishing in the Sunflower State. According to Cornell University's All About Birds website, the bald eagle has been the national emblem of the United States since 1782 and a spiritual symbol for native people for far longer than that. These regal birds aren't really bald, but their white feathered heads gleam in contrast to their chocolate brown body and wings. Look for them soaring in solitude, chasing other birds for their food, or gathering by the hundreds in winter. Once endangered by hunting and pesticides, bald eagles have flourished under protection. The bald eagle dwarfs most other raptors, including the turkey vulture and red-tailed hawk. It has a heavy body, large head, and long hooked bill. In flight, a bald eagle holds its broad wings flat like a board. Adult bald eagles have white heads and tails with dark brown bodies and wings. Their legs and bills are bright yellow. Immature birds have mostly dark heads and tails. Their brown wings and bodies are mottled with white in varying amounts. Young birds attain adult plumage in about five years. You'll find bald eagles soaring high in the sky, flapping low over treetops with slow wing beats, or perched in trees or on the ground. Bald eagles scavenge many meals by harassing other birds or by eating carrion or garbage. They eat mainly fish, but also hunt mammals, gulls, and waterfowl. Look for bald eagles near lakes, reservoirs, rivers, or marshes. For a chance to see large bald eagle congregations, check out our Kansas Wildlife Refuges or lakes this winter and make sure you take a camera. 
Are you going to start or me? <laughs> We're back. You never let me start. Huh? This is the close, Frank. We're done. Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Bye. I'm Deb. He's I'm still Frank, Frank. I think. And we'll see you somewhere. Around Kansas. <laughs> Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Homemade ice cream. Let me tell you, Kansas is more than tornadoes. We're the best part of Dorothy's dream. We're the best part of Dorothy's dream. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com.